Welcome one, welcome all. Thank you for tuning in to Cedarly Radio, your guide to films playing at the Art House for the week of August 16th to August 22nd. My name is Aaron Spears. And I'm Dave Huffman. On this week's episode, we'll be discussing Where Do You Go Bernadette, Blinded by the Light, and Mike Wallace is Here. We'll also be discussing the varying visual styles of auteurs, the unknown early careers of media celebrities, and our Cedarly three picks for films that have idols that inspire. Well, we always like to start off the show with the last scene first, because uh, our show's a little backwards like that. So, Dave, what is the last film you've seen? Oh, I caught up on, uh, I know you'd like to say, when I say I caught up on a real classic, and you always <laughs> wonder if I'm talking about a real classic, uh, this one is not. Uh, it is uh, from 1986. It's The Wraith, starring Charlie Sheen and Sher- a young Sherilyn Fenn. The Wraith? And a... The Wraith and Nick Cassavetes. Ooh. It's about, it's about, yeah, I know. Uh, I didn't even recognize that it was Nick Cassavetes. Even after I was aware that it was Nick Cassavetes, yeah. I still couldn't identify that it was Nick <laughs> Cassavetes. Um, it is uh, a, not a very good movie. It's kind of like campy fun bad about uh, this guy that gets killed in by these... Uh, guys that race cars if you race them and they beat you then you they get your car and he gets killed by them and he comes back as this you know spiritual kind of you know revenge car that the wraith that reeks gets revenge on all the people that kill okay him. hold on hold on so. hold on hold on hold on <laughs> <laughs> he comes back as a ghost car as it kind of as a driver and the car yes there's sort of one spiritual sort of revenge vehicle if you will yeah, i love this so yeah wait is the car a ghost or is it like an actual car yes. but you can see yeah everyone can see it okay but it's uh yes but it's uh, you know <laughs> can it'll just uh disappear in, in a burst of you know ghostly stars sometimes and things and with great 80s effect it's it's pretty entertaining in a fun bad way and if you watch the trailer the thing you're most going to remember about the trailer is clint howard's hair and uh and also a standout of the film as well okay another hold on clint (laughs) howard and hair (laughs) yeah you gotta see it it's uh yeah it's pretty fantastic so (laughs) i i I watched that little gem i have a friend who's obsessed with sherilyn fenn and i was just like scrolling through movies and i was like have you ever seen this this movie the wraith he's like oh like years ago and so we watched it last night i was really really hoping you watched it on vhs because it sounds like a perfect like old vhs find it more or less was because I watched it off of uh, it was streaming on Hulu and the uh, it was just streaming at four three so it was like watching oh, it yeah, on VHS yeah. it wasn't even like you know widescreen or anything like that so it did have <laughs> a a very VHS vibe to it that straight up sounds like uh, a Scooby Doo episode <laughs> like it hundred <really, laughs> percent yeah it could have wow. been and it's funny because Charlie Sheen is top build but he's like barely in it it's very oh uh, right yeah strange yeah you, you I think he is maybe. 15 minutes of screen time possibly okay maybe. so more than more than ferris bueller but less than like yes know, a yeah, yeah, vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> right and what was the last gem you saw uh actually i did watch a gem uh i oh, watched right. children of men uh rewatch oh um, i love 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 it well mm-hmm. i read this article that was talking about like classical camera work where like it's uh-huh. just in service of the plot the story and it doesn't really call attention to itself uh versus like children of men where like it kind of does call attention to itself but mm-hmm. Kind of like how it functions in the narrative. I don't know. It was kind of a you know it was a geeky kind of scholarly article, but I, it was one of those that I realized within like four paragraphs, I, I was like, I need to watch this movie again because it's there's yeah. certain movies that out there that just either you see the poster again or you catch the trailer somewhere or it just pops in your head and like you're like, okay, I need to watch that right now. And that movie yeah. is, is one of those. So or you or you see Clint Howard's hair. You're right. Yeah. You're like, yeah. oh my god, I gotta see this one. <laughs> But uh, no, I just rewatched that as well earlier this year when really? I was in Austin. That's the one I went to see at the Alamo oh, Draft that's right. House. They yeah. they had a thirty five millimeter screening of it at one of the draft houses down there, and uh, it was great. Yeah, I love this. What was my favorite movie of that year? It's my number one. I think it's just a pretty much a masterpiece. I love it. I also always think of it as like a hit movie of his because artistically, to me, it's a hit movie of his. But mm-hmm. it really wasn't at all no. financially. Why you know a, yeah. a hit movie? But um, anyway, I'm glad he got to make it. It's also. Um, Movies that I adore and I love, um, uh, when anytime I rewatch them in the last like four or five years, I love going and reading like the really negative reviews of them just to kind of see like, what didn't people like about this? So I read a couple of negative reviews of this one and it's one there of those was a instances. negative review. Yeah. One was like the, uh, <laughs> it was some conservative website that oh, was complaining because gotcha. the, in the book, there's like a heavy, like religious aspect to it. That's not in the oh. movie. So that means okay. it's bad, of course. Um, <laughs> but, uh, this one was one of those where like some of the negative ones were, um, 
all the reasons why it was bad was like, no, that's why it's amazing. Like, it's just a matter of yeah. interpretation. You I just guess, disagreed that, with them. Yeah. Yeah. I always tell so. people movies are subjective. More there. than more than once have I argued with someone about a film that or the things that I loved about it is exactly is why they why don't they like it. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So before we get into the uh, art house uh, buzz for this week, Dave, your last scene is the Wraith. Sounded like a recommend. <laughs> uh, well, you know, if you're if you're so inclined that you think you would enjoy a 1980s Charlie Sheen campy movie, then yeah, I'd recommend it. But otherwise, you can live without it. it. it, it you know what you're getting into if you're you're yeah. ready for it. Yeah, and then uh, it certainly is not essential viewing though. Right, which Children of Men is essential viewing if you've never seen it. Uh, right, you know, just stop listening and go watch it right now. Yes. Uh, well, something that isn't subjective is uh, whether or not people are coming out to see and support a movie. And uh, the farewell mm-hmm. and Once Upon a Time are still, yeah, they're still, still getting still support. Going strong, mm-hmm. yeah, those are still doing great here at the Cedar Lee. And this week, the uh, it, we can't even say the new movie that we opened up because it was a film we reopened up, True. and that was uh, Toni Morrison, The Pieces I Am, which we brought back in honor of her, um, uh, you know, to pay tribute to her legacy since she just passed. And it did great. I mean, like a lot of people came out. We only had a single show a day this last this last week, but it did so well that this coming week we're expanding it and having uh, more shows for it. So it is holding on another week. So people have more time to catch it because I don't think enough people saw it whenever we first opened it. And I think um, just the attention in the press that her um, legacy has garnered that more people are a little more interested in seeing the film and, and and hearing her talk and other people talk about her life and her and her work so i hope people come out and see it so then in the uh kind of specialty box office world we have a couple movies that are coming soon uh very soon mm-hmm. actually to yes. cedar uh mm-hmm. the peanut butter falcon opened and was kind of number one at the specialty box office as well as one child nation the uh documentary that uh right. is next week i think well coming soon so, either way they're yeah, both uh both on soon. their way yeah mm-hmm uh, one uh, fiction film and one documentary. Uh, mm-hmm. Both of them are getting you know fantastic reviews as well. And yep. I uh, kind of got to go back and forth with uh, you know box office coverage, which obviously, especially box office, is a little different because we're trying to gauge whether or not movies are connecting with people and right. looking at especially box office, not from just like the horse race of you know like let's make the most money. It's kind of more of like which movies people that kind of rise above. Um, you know, rise rise at the top on the independent film scene and are getting some attention and getting some audience support, and then presumably that will translate to Cleveland. Mm-hmm. Uh, I found an article that was talking about how at the general multiplex box office, as we'll call it, it's been 16 straight weeks of, like, pre-existing IPs, intellectual properties, so, like, sequels, yeah. reboots, um, the Lion King being, what is that genre, like, a uh, live-action kind of remake of... Mm-hmm cartoons so it's 16 straight weeks of just repeats basically reruns and uh you don't get that at the specialty box office um almost ever i guess every (laughs) once in a while there's like an american remake of a foreign film i guess but uh you know if you want you know the bit more uh the the fresh uh you know new talent new time new kinds of ways to tell stories uh i would say the more interesting films that's why we tend to focus on that's why we focus on the specialty box office as opposed Mm -hmm. to like hey you know lion king's number one again like yeah what a surprise yeah disney's able to get butts in seats who would have thought well i'm after seeing lion king i'm surprised they got as many butts in seats as they did that's what i've heard from anybody i've talked to that's seen it yeah it's it boggles my mind that that movie has made that much money because i don't know one person that liked it really even that and I, I can't even say loved it. Like I, literally every person I've talked to that has seen it hasn't liked it. So yeah. uh, I, I'm just, you know, but some, obviously I'm just not talking to the right people because it's made like $1.3 billion I know. worldwide it's or crazy. something. So, uh, and it's just, I, uh, yeah, it boggles my mind, but good, good for them. Apparently Disney is a strong brand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And people love the Lion King. Yeah. All right, and we will be right back with the new films opening this week at the theater. Well, the first new film we are opening this week is the new film from director Richard Linklater, a favorite of mine. Uh, Where Did You Go? Sorry, not Where Did. Where'd You Go, Bernadette? Mm -hmm. Uh, Loving mom becomes compelled to reconnect with her creative passions after years of sacrificing herself for her family. Her leap of faith takes her on an epic adventure that jumpstarts her life and leads her to triumphant rediscovery. People like you must create. If you don't, you become a menace to society. How would I know? Why should I care? Something unexpected has come up. Just thinking about it's got my heart racing. Please don't bother trying to find her. I have concocted a plan. Bernadette! She's not there! 
You'll never guess what happened. She disappeared. Bernadette jumped out a window. There's one answer to all of your problems. Get your ass back to work. A huge project has come up. It will require me to go to Antarctica. It's twice the challenge anyone ever imagines, with long stretches without sleep and exercise. Sounds like I've been in training for this for the last 20 years. I have this one shot to launch my second act. So step aside, because I am about to kick the hell out of life. World domination ain't pretty. Whoa. This movie, I'm obviously looking forward to because I like Linklater, but this, ah, uh, Richard Linklater has frustrated me so much throughout his career <laughs> where he keeps picking projects that, like, I just can't get excited about, but yeah. I see them, and then I'm like, damn, he made another great movie. Mostly it's been his adaptations over the years, like Fast Food uh -huh. Nation, um, Bernie, I was, like, so-so, like, I read the articles that it was based on. Yeah. Uh, me and Orson Welles actually was was quite good, but... Also, there's a movie there. I was like, ah, oh, Zac Efron. And then when I walked out of the movie, I was like, I love Zac Efron now. This is amazing. Yeah, that, it was a very good movie. Yeah, yeah. I, he's, he's one of those filmmakers that I think is a, a very talented person and a solid filmmaker, but he's not one of those people that I'm like, oh, I have to see the new Richard Linklater movie. Like, I haven't clicked with him like the right. same way that you've clicked with him. Yeah. Um. So, I, and I kind of almost see it's some of his films, I feel like, are are more serviceable sort of like he was hired to th this this movie has that kind of feel like i feel like anybody else could have made this movie in a yeah. way like it doesn't really have like his distinctive stamp on it right. i would say but uh it's very good i really liked it it was one that again um i love kate blanchett so i was looking forward to seeing right. it and she does another great job it's a very entertaining funny movie it's got uh kristen wig in a supporting role as the you know the, her sort of nemesis neighbor as she's been kind of sheltering herself in this monstrosity of a house that she's uh, took on as a project that she's never finished that's become sort of a metaphor for her her life and it, as she's been struggling to kind of you know reconnect uh, after uh, one major setback in her professional career and it's taken her years and years and years to realign herself and get her bell herself back on track and that's what this film's all about it's about a woman who you know has kind of put her her talents in the back seat and shifted her attention into her family and the effects that's had on her both you know emotionally and you know artistically and everything else and it's it's a really charming movie that uh has a kind of nice feel goody kind of payoff at the end so this is sort of like feel good movie week at the cedar lee with this and our other that's true our yeah yeah we're opening yeah well, we should mention too that um the where, where'd you go bernadette is based on the novel of the same name from maria semple mm -hmm. from 2012 which is one of those distinctions of it spent literally a year uh, as a New York Times bestseller and was yeah. kind of one of those like literary uh, phenomenon that just popped up and mm -hmm. everyone just like went nuts for this book, which again, I read and it's fine. Like I, it was mm -hmm. one of those as I was reading it and then finished, it, it was like, I don't get why some things just connect and they don't. I mean, I guess that's, you know, what makes people individuals right. and all that. But just it wasn't bad by any means. Like it's a, it's a mm -hmm. solid and a really good read. I would recommend it. It's a very enjoyable read. But it was one of those like this caught on. OK. Sure. <laughs> well, I'll be anxious since I haven't read the book. I'll be anxious to hear um, what you think after you've seen the film. To hear what, how you feel, well, like, that, what has been. That's kind of. I haven't. Re I haven't read any of the articles yet about you know anyone any criticism uh, about that. Kind yeah. Of, you know, comparing it to the film. So he. Um, I always. I mean, obviously, I think of Richard Linklater. I think you do too. Is like writer director because he's you mm -hmm. know written everything he's done. Right. But he's also. I mean, he's done a lot of adaptations, which I've mm -hmm. found. Interesting, because like you said, a lot of times, um, like Suburbia is a play adaptation, so it's very wordy, very dialogue driven. Right. So it feels like one of his movies. But, yes. um, you know, me and Orson Welles and Bernie, they they have like such strong characters that they still feel mm -hmm. like his kind of movies. And I feel like he's able to put a stamp on it that way. So, I, yeah, I'm curious to see, um, like you said, if this isn't like we said with Children of Men, like there's a very visual style to Quaron's movies. That's sort right. of maybe like the lacking element in a lot of Linklater stuff. There's no like, oh, that looks like a. Linklater movie the way it looks like a that, Scorsese movie so yeah that's true because like I'd actually kind of forgot that he did Bernie which I loved yeah so uh, it's funny that I always kind of say like eh 
Richard Linklater. But when I think about, there's a lot of his movies that I really love. So it might just be that there's some of his films, the ones that like Slacker, I have like pretty much no use for. So, <laughs> oh, oh, that hurts. <laughs> That's because I just kind of wanted to dr- go into the theater, or into the into the screen, and just start shaking people. Okay. Like all the you know the, every person on screen just kind of irritated me. So like, and I think that that just sort of started me off in a bad, you know, like. Uh, on the bad foot with him or something sure 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 there's uh but most of his films since like i love all the before movies those are great yeah yeah and there's a lot of his works that i do love but yeah i know slacker just didn't do anything for me i know that's all right indies like we said teach their own one of the most important yeah Mm -hmm. you can you can uh you can jump in the screen and shake me later (laughs) the next film they're going to be opening up is another feel-good movie it's blinded by the light by director garinda chata and this is a film set in the 80s uh during thatcher's britain about a teenager uh who's of pakistani descent uh who uh becomes obsessed with the music of bruce springsteen bruce the direct line to all this true in this shitty world seriously what does he know about our world You should be listening to our music before you start getting confused and hating yourself. I listen to everything. I can feel it all right here. It's like Bruce knows everything I've ever felt, everything I've ever wanted. My poems, they're not brilliant, but they're mine. Do you think that this man sings for people like us? But he talks to me. You cannot be serious, mate. My dream was to come here and work hard for my family. If you don't try to fix this, we will lose our son for good. This guy is incredible. You've never heard lyrics like his. Is that Billy Joel? Billy Joel? You try and raise your kids right, Jay. Get Bruce sings about not letting the hardness of the world stop you from letting the best of you slip away. My hope is to build a bridge to my ambitions, but not a wall between my family and me. Purpose of your visit? I'm going to see Bruce Springsteen's hometown. I can't think of a better reason to visit the United States than to see the home of the boss. Dave, another uh, period film set in England. Were you uh, mm-hmm. were you psyched as, a, as an Anglophile to be <laughs> traveling back to Thatcher's well, England on screen? This is the thing. I do not really like Bruce Springsteen. He's not like a musical artist that I've ever kind of clicked with. And I appreciate him as a person and what he's done, you know, politically and stuff like that. But his music has never really like clicked with me. Yeah. So I was kind of intrigued by a movie that was really going to focus on how his lyrics speak to someone who's completely removed from the Bruce Springsteen world. Like they kind of talk about that. Like, you know, why are you listening to this? you know white guy from america's like music what is he speaking to like a, a you know pakistani immigrant in england you right know, those aren't the same kind of worlds that you want to think that their their music would connect with right so i was intrigued by that as a concept and when the movie starts all the music is this great kind of like 80s british you know new wave music i'm like oh the score this is going to be cool if it's like peppered with this right and i was expecting to just have nothing but bruce springsteen music the whole time but when it does kick into the bruce springsteen music whenever he kind of discovers was Bruce Springsteen she does the director does something really cool with it where like and, and this is in the trailer too you can see like the lyrics are part of the um the text of the lyrics is on the screen and like swirling around him or projected on a building right, and right. it's like this visual element to the film that really makes it more interesting yeah. and kind of shows these are the words and how they speak to him and how they are affecting him and how he does relate to them. And so I thought it was really effective and a, and a cool kind of cinematic way of doing that. So I, I it was very theatrical in, in a way, and I, I thought it was really effective. And it is a very kind of... Um, you know, a predictable kind of feel good movie, but it's very effective and right. it, and it does absolutely like leave audiences feeling, you know, energized. So I I, I think her, her last film, I think was it Bennett like Beckham her last film or has she No, she did um it? Viceroy's House uh just a couple of years ago. Oh I you know I didn't see Viceroy's uh, House but uh but I did see I I, I really loved uh Bennett Like Beckham. It yeah. has that same kind of, you know, vibe of this is like a, a teenage, you know, immigrant uh, uh you know uh 
living in uh, England and having to face the sort of, you know, racism of, you know, the society and, and tr trying to find their footing. And it's it's a really charming little movie. So I think she's got a great eye for that. Well, she also did uh, Bride and Prejudice years ago as well, where like, it's, she, yeah, she seems like she has a really solid format of like, mm -hmm. like you said, it's it's kind of in that feel good kind of movie, uh, but has its own unique twist to it. Um, like she right. really does focus on a lot of themes of um, Indians living in England, but also sort of like that converging of traditional values versus mm -hmm. the modern culture that everybody is living in. I'm sorry, I just I have to point out as you're talking about Bruce Springsteen and and, and uh, British music, like you're wearing a Robbie Williams T-shirt right now, and it was, <laughs> I was like, well, not really a Bruce Springsteen fan. I was like, I I can tell, but the people listening were unaware of yes. the uh, the T-shirt I'm staring at right now. Yeah, it's it's true. Yeah, I, I do have a lot of Robbie Williams. Wait, so we could but, reverse yeah. this and do a guy from Pennsylvania who grew up and was inspired yeah. by Robbie Williams movies that cross culturally mm -hmm. that way and do it. Uh, do it from this side yeah, of the pond. Yeah, and obviously Robbie Robbie's music's a lot about you know his uh, struggles with uh, you know uh, drug addiction and fame, which I, I have neither of those. So yeah, right. right. So it really, I really would speak to you. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, last film that we are opening up is another uh, alumni from the Cleveland International Film Festival this past spring. It is Mike Wallace is here from director uh, Avi Belkin. For over 50 years, 60 Minutes, fearsome newsman Mike Wallace went head to head with the 20th century's most influential figures. Uh, relying exclusively on archival footage, Mike Wallace is here, kind of allows, uh, in a way, like, when you watch the trailer, like, Mike Wallace almost interrogates himself, or, you know, interviews mm -hmm. himself. It's a really interesting way to tell uh, tell the story on uh, Mike Wallace and his very, uh, you know, long career working, we'll just say, generally in media, because he started mm -hmm. off back in the radio days and uh, transitioned to a uh, journalist, uh, famous uh, journalist by the end of his career. The mention of my first guest's name has been known to strike fear into the hearts of brave men and women. I'm Mike Wallace. I'm Mike Wallace. I'm Mike Wallace. I'm Mike Wallace. He was tough as nails, never took orders from anybody. Why are you sometimes such a prick? <laughs> People didn't ask tough questions back then. You invented that genre. You're not answering the specific question that I put. You ask tough questions that get behind the facade. I've never seen an interview that you did not dominate. It was my first. I'll ask the question, please. You're a son of a bitch. Do you know that? Oh, come on. You are Barbara. a son of a bitch. But the folks at CBS News said, come up with an idea. This is 60 Minutes. We were experimenting. We were trying to find out what worked and what didn't work. Nobody thought it was going to last. That's when we began to do the real investigative stuff. This film, well, then the, the trailer kind of specifically talks to that aspect of like the role of the news media, which right. you think of as this like thing of a bygone era back when like 60 Minutes was started <laughs> and what it was doing. But I was like, wow, this is really weird. I was just watching archival footage that's mo a lot of, you know, black and white and everything is still mm -hmm. so, so relevant. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, you know, it is one of those tragic things, sort of like what's, what I think is just, contributed to the terrible some terrible elements in our society is whenever you know cnn started and there had to go to a 24-hour news cycle and you had to like fill every waking second and then it wasn't really about news anymore it becomes about editorialization and it becomes about opinion and things like that as right. opposed to news because it's easier you know, to fill time that way right yeah that's that's you just need talking heads to keep, just keep going on and spouting about theories it's not even about like you're not reporting on news you're talking about hypothetical situations and how you think they might play out right and right that's what most of that coverage is which is why i have very little patience for pretty much all cable news i can't really watch it anymore because it isn't news you're right. not talking about news you're not talking about things that actually have happened or the impacts of the things that have happened most of the time they're talking about the theoretical effects of those and right. uh you know other scenarios and how they think they're going to play out you know you that's not news yet you know right, you're right, right. talking about a fantasy and so when you talk about someone like mike wallace who's kind of made his bread and butter over the years has been this hard-hitting and uh, you know investigative journalism and these wonderful pieces you know i grew up watching 60 minutes like a lot of people do and they yeah, still yeah. do amazing you know work and that is this kind of you know why people like him there just isn't a, a contemporary equivalent you know you know anderson cooper has a, a good reputation and everything, but it's not like everyone's like Anderson Cooper's out there doing, you know, hard hitting investigative journalism. Right, right. You know, he's he's mostly 
kind of critical thinking and, and editorializing most of the time about the day's news. So uh, someone like, you know, Mike Wallace, I just don't, I don't know that we're ever going to have that era of news kind of, you know, Walter Cronkite and, and Mike Wallace and Diane Sawyer, those kind of people back again. Reading some of the, the history of this era too, uh, I was taken aback when I was like, oh, Mike Wallace uh, st- getting started in radio. He was a game show host for a while. He was an actor and then, <laughs> you know, went into journalism eventually. And then also right. mentioned Walter Cronkite also mm-hmm. briefly hosted a game show before becoming... Yeah. I mean, yeah. like the Walter Cronkite that we picture because these are, you know, people of a bygone era that we weren't, right. you know, we were kind of like connected to a little bit in our youth, but mm-hmm. um, not in their heyday. Uh, you yeah. know, when you say Walter Cronkite, I picture like, you know, he's like, you know, the, mm-hmm. you know, name in, in, you know, a legitimate, like great broadcast journalism. Uh, I can't picture him hosting a game show. <laughs> no, that would be awesome, though. I'm sure, you know, there's YouTube clips somewhere. I just haven't, uh, <laughs> haven't sought those out just yet. So we'll be uh, right back with our Cedarly Three picks for this week. All right, well, each week we like to take inspiration from one of the new films opening and suggest three films to broaden your cinematic world. This week's topic was inspired by Blinded by the Light, where uh, Javid, the main character, as we said, he's inspired by the lyrics of Bruce Springsteen to chase his own dreams. He doesn't want to be like the next... Bruce Springsteen necessarily, like he's not a mm-hmm. musician, but it inspires him to chase his own dreams um, by being inspired by one of his idols. So these are idols that inspire, and uh, we always mm-hmm. joke, I think we've been joking for, I don't know, 40-some weeks now about how, like, wow, what a broad topic. <laughs> this is pretty specific, and this... actually was kind of a challenge to uh, yeah. put this together. I apologize to Aaron because uh, I came up with this. I suggested this one, and then uh, in last week, whenever I thought of it, I had all these movies in my head that I that worked, and then I couldn't remember any of them when I sat down to make my list. <laughs> so I had to come up with some other ideas. And I was also trying to think of since we're talking about Blinded by the Light, I was trying to think of things that were music related, right, or m- musical performer related, that kind of thing. Um, and but I didn't want it to just be like this person loved whatever you know, and then they did. so anyway. Right, right, right. Uh, <laughs> I'm being very, very articulate. To Today on the podcast. Well, also, Blinded by the Light, uh, I haven't seen that one yet, but that one sounds very positive. Like, it inspired him to yeah, be a better person. Right. Um, and for mm-hmm. some reason, I got one that kind of works that way. Well, but uh, Well, go ahead. Let's start with yours. Well, the first uh, one I thought of was The King of Comedy, because right. Rupert Pumpkin's, oh, yeah. like, idol uh-huh. is the Jerry Lewis yep. character, and he's inspired yeah. by him, but, like... Right. Not in a blinded by the light kind of way. Like it's no, it's, but it's not good. That's a great one. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of mine is also not good, so that's okay. Um, but yeah, that's a great film, and of course, you'd figure out a way to get a Scorsese. Film of course, there, I would. So yeah, that, that that makes sense. Um, and you'll be happy to know that two of my three are British. Well, actually, that's not true. One of them's Australian. So anyway, oh, okay. But the well, I'll start with my negative one too. In that same regard, I was thinking of the film Copycat. Which is a total oh, kind of like wow. sort of forgotten '90s thriller, yeah. With uh, Helen, uh, um, not Helen Hunt, uh, <laughs> Hel- um, Holly Hunter, Holly Hunter, <laughs> <laughs> Holly Hunter and Sigourney Weaver, and Harry Connick Jr. of all people. That's true. And yeah, it's you know it's a it's a, about a copycat serial killer movie. So I was thinking <laughs> there's someone that's inspired by no no that's their idols. I like their that. idols are these serial killers, and that's who they're inspired by. So and I just remember really enjoying that movie. I haven't seen it since 1995 so it's probably not aged well at all probably I don't not know that probably I'm not. recommend people watch it but i remember really kind of just enjoying it as a sort of you know popcorn you know thriller movie and i love sigourney weaver and i love uh, holly hunter even though a minute ago i couldn't remember her name uh so i and i i just really enjoyed copycat that uh you're not alone that was the era when i worked at a video store and it rented constantly even uh-huh. when it was off the new release shelf people would be like what's that one because nobody remembered the name yeah. of it it was like what's that one it was like oh it's copycat <laughs> and it, it rented uh it rented all there the time go. and what's next on your list next one i've got is um uh i'm trying to figure out a good way to describe it this it's a chilean film from a director i really like pablo lorraine who did uh probably most famous in america for doing jackie with natalie portman mm-hmm. a few years ago he did one called uh tony monero Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This yeah. guy who is, it, it's set in um, uh, the Pinochet, you know, regime is, is in charge mm-hmm. in Chile, so it's not a good time, to put it lightly. Um, yeah. And he goes and sees Saturday Night Fever and becomes obsessed right. with the John Travolta character. John Travolta, yep. To kind of the detriment yeah. of his, I mean, it, it like some aspects to it, like it's, it gives him an outlet because he wants to like uh, dress right. like him, he wants to dance, he wants to know every single move, he mm-hmm. wants to build, he wants to put glass blocks into the dance floor. 
um, yeah. in his apartment building so that he can, you know, put out lights in there and dance like Tony Monero. So, like, it's literally his obsession and his idol. Um, but, like, the setting for it is so interesting. It, it speaks to, like, how the influence of Hollywood on other cultures, but then also... Mm-hmm. Yeah, like obsessive characters. Uh, you know, that's got to be. I got to put that in the king of comedy section too. Like it's it's <laughs> detrimental <laughs> obsession. I would say in this one. Yeah. I mean, there's some lighter moments where like it's it's a benefit to him. It's an outlet, but like it leads him into some pretty dark spots. I love that you suggested that, and I love that you thought of that movie. So good job, Aaron. Appreciate uh, it. The next one on my list, are the next two are kind of music related ones. Uh, Little Voice from 1998, starring uh, Brenda Blethyn and Jane Horrocks. Oh, we played it yeah, here at yeah. the Cedar Lee. Yeah, uh, it's about a, a woman who's this very kind of shy, mousy person. But when she gets on stage, she has the ability to basically sing vocally like other classic uh, vocalists. And so she's inspired by all of these classic pop vocalists like Judy Garland, and you know, uh, and she can just get up there and mimic their voices and. It's, you know that becomes you know her portal into a whole new life that so she you know becomes a little more brave to face the world so uh if you haven't seen little voice i'd really recommend it it's a charming little movie with a great soundtrack jane horrocks if uh if you're a fan of uh ab uh ab fab of absolutely fabulous jane horrocks played bubbles uh the assistant on there and you know it's just a completely different kind of uh, performance from her because if you only saw her as that sort of quintessential ditzy blonde assistant this is a great great performance again that was one of those like had i didn't meet anybody sort of opposite of the lion king we discussed earlier anybody i uh-huh. talked to that saw a little voice like oh my god you've got to see that movie like it was yeah. just one of those like just charmed everybody that saw it, and i didn't mm-hmm. ever heard anything bad about it um yeah. so much so that i've still never seen it Oh my so, gosh! Uh, well, uh, because you were you were had a chip on your shoulder about it. I must have. Yeah. You figured. Yeah. <laughs> You're like I'm tired of everyone here at the Cedar Lee talking. Well, about as I say, every once in a while, voices. like there's that movie that if I don't see it right away, then you go three, four weeks in when you're sure. you know after a forty hours week of every just be like it's the greatest thing ever. Mm-hmm. I'm like oh just stop. Yeah. I'm not like I still haven't but, seen Slumdog Millionaire for the same reason, which is it, not a good got, reason. It's not a good reason. I'm no, just that, saying that's, that's my reason. That's not a good reason. <laughs> but it's got uh, you know uh, other amazing supporting cast like Michael Caine's in it and Ewan McGregor and Jim Broadbent. So it's just got this fantastic cast and it's a really charming, great movie. And what's the next one on your My list? My last one is Whiplash. So I was mm-hmm. thinking of like music ones and that one came to mind. Mm-hmm. Well, that one's actually different though because this character meets his idol and he gets to work with his right. idol. But then also mm-hmm. alternatively to the detriment at a certain times, right. but also, you know, he gets a great performance and he develops even stronger as an artist and a performer. So, yeah. you know, and he also it's one of those odd ones where like it's not um, he's in for the self-sacrifice in this and mm-hmm. the story of Whiplash. It's not like he's I mean, it's it's abusive. Sure. But like he's he's volunteering for the abuse and like. Right. Is is on board with it. So it's it's kind of an interesting dynamic. And uh, God, man, just like Children of Men, just thinking about that movie again, like just I want to watch it right now. I've yeah, it's seen a, it it's way a too many times. Movie. And what is your what is your final one, Dave? The final film uh, I was also trying to think of a movie that um, ties into the the Mike Wallace uh, movie that we're opening up, and uh, I wanted to try to uh, the, a film that popped into my head about uh, a young woman who is idolizing one of her her news anchor idols, Diane Sawyer, and that is the uh, Kristen Dunst comedy uh, from 1999, Drop Dead Gorgeous which you probably don't think about as someone uh, thinking about their no, idols. Oh, I'm racking my brain right now. <laughs> the whole time, all she does is talk about how she wants to be the next Diane Sawyer. Like, that is her goal. Oh, like she, yeah, yeah, she yeah. She is only going into this beauty pageant because Diane Sawyer had won a beauty pageant. Like she, had she the, really? The whole thing is about, yeah. <laughs> so the whole thing is about her, you know, wanting to be like Diane Sawyer. And huh. uh, it's 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 a subtle kind of character detail in the background. It's certainly not the no, no, that, still that works, movie. No, it still works, though. But it is, if you've never, it's one of my favorite little, like, weird forgotten comedies. Uh, Denise Richards and uh, is perfect in it. I will defend Denise Richards to the ends of the earth, as some people know, because I think that she's never been miscast because she knows exactly what she is. And uh, it's just a really funny, strange movie. It's got Allison Janney in it and uh, Ellen Barkin and uh, Kirstie Alley. It's just yeah, yeah. got a great cast of just really fun, over the top, uh, uh, you know, characters. I didn't know that Diane Sawyer won any beauty competition. Um, mm-hmm. And I also didn't know that Mike Wallace used to host game shows so like there's there this go. whole uh history of uh you know famous icons uh and tv personalities that uh, i'm learning all about this episode there you go I-, I feel like i just had to like google and find out uh what beauty pageant she won 
Oh, she she won the Junior Miss Beauty Pageant in 1963. So there you go. Well, that was well before my time. So I'm <laughs> also I've never tracked beauty pageants. So <laughs> even if it happened when I was alive, I still wouldn't know about it probably. Well, next week's episode, we will be discussing three new films scheduled to open as of right now. We've got The Nightingale, The Peanut Butter Falcon, and Loose. And next week's Cedar Lee 3 will be inspired by Jennifer Kent's new uh, film, The Nightingale, A Revenge Tale. Uh, So our topic is going to be revenge films. If you have any that are particularly near and dear to your heart, submit your picks at Cedar Lee Theater using the hashtag Cedar Lee 3, the number 3. But before we sign off this week, we do want to let you know about a few, no, not a few, a special event that we have coming up this week. This week, we were going to be showing the National Theater Live presentation of the Lehman Trilogy. This is a new play about the collapse of the Lehman Brothers uh, that triggered the financial crisis, and it's directed by Oscar winner Sam Mendes. And that is going to be playing Sunday, August 18th at 11 a.m. and Wednesday, August 21st at 7 (laughs) p.m. As always, thank you for tuning in to Cedar Lee Radio and lending us your ears this week. All the music heard on the show is original music written by Grant Heinemann and performed by the New Heights Jazz Ensemble, used with their permission, of course. Visit clevelandcinemas.com for correct showtimes and to purchase advanced tickets. Also, there are links in the show notes. You can use those if you'd like as well. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are at Cedar Lee Theater, spelled with an R-E at the end because we're fancy like that. Don't forget to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcast. And while you're subscribing, leave us a rating and review or better yet, tell a fellow film geek about the show. We'll see you at the movies.